Welcome, Ricky Wilby. You're live on the show. Yeah. What What more can we want? Look at that. Look at the size of that smile on your face. You obviously, <laughs> things, are, things are clearly going good for you. I. Uh, I got uh, a full night sleep. Really little... smile these days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's really good just to catch up with you because I know what a ridiculously busy man you are. Uh, <laughs> do you ever have a quiet day? Is, is there such a thing in your life? Nothing there is, no. Uh, yeah, running here, there and everywhere, I think, at the minute. Well, I think people in the rugby league world will know you, um, but obviously this is going to go as a, a vlog and a podcast to the wider sporting world, so I think everybody will be intrigued with your story you're going to tell. Um, I, I know you're, you're based in sunny Huddersfield, as you just told me off, off the camera. Yeah. Uh, at the moment. Uh, are you a Huddersfield lad by nature and by background? From Leeds originally, but brought up in, in Holmford. Right. Uh, and now me and my, my wife and daughter live just outside, just outside, between Huddersfield and Wakefield. So. And whatever you do, don't give out your address online. <laughs> so uh, I, we know you're a fan of the oval shaped ball, but um, yeah. was there any inkling in your growing up to the round shaped ball? And if so, was it the team that's just been promoted, or is it the one that's uh, in it's the, the one championship? It's the Premier League, actually. Sorry? It's the one that's just won the Premier League, actually. It's the one that's just won the Premier League? Yeah. So, growing up, or, or, or my uncle played, so we always used to spend the weekends going and watching, watching him play rugby uh, at various grounds. Yeah. Uh, and then went to high school, and someone said, what football team do you support? <laughs> Got no idea. So I went home and said to Dad, said, Dad, what football team do I support? He says, support Liverpool. They win things. And he lied drastically. Uh, but, yeah, what a great year they've had this year. Fantastic year. Been a good two years, in fairness. I mean, you're a lot younger than me, but uh, I think when I, certainly when I go back to primary school days, everybody was a Liverpool fan or a Leeds fan in the playgrounds. Right. Um, irrespective of whether you lived anywhere near Merseyside or Yorkshire. That's just the way it was. Yeah. But uh, good choice. And yeah, they're des deservedly champions, aren't they? Wh whoever you support. Yeah, they've, they've done great this year and clearly doing well on and off the field. And uh, obviously being in Huddersfield now, and we're going to be going to talking a lot about rugby league, um, have you had much of a connection with um, Huddersfield Giants over the years? Uh, yeah. When I left school, I actually worked for Ken Davey. Did you really? Yeah, a bit of a tenuous link uh, in his financial management company. Just right. as a young, just as a young apprentice, paper boy, uh, letter opening boy. But yeah, no, it was uh, Ken was good. He got me a trial with the Giants, and yeah, he's uh, an upstanding gentleman, isn't he? Very much so. And I think we've touched base on this before, but you know, one of my buddies, um, Sean Jarvis. Yeah. Who was the he was the commercial director obviously at Huddersfield Town Football Club. Uh, we worked together in terms of saving Oldham Athletic Football Club back in 2004 before he, he headed over to Yorkshire. Yeah. Um, and he's now left and is now the CEO at Leicestershire County Cricket Club. Yes, I've seen that on his LinkedIn. I was thinking just uh, as I was driving down the motorway the other day, are there that many people who uh, are within rugby league in terms of the the management structure and thinking more sort of the CEO type level that then go on into other sports. You can certainly think of quite a few examples from rugby union, but maybe it's just my lack of knowledge that I don't know as many in rugby league. The guy who used to be chief executive at Bradford Bulls, who's now involved in cricket, I think, at the minute. Oh, really? Uh, and the head of communications for the England cricket team is, is a former rugby league, uh, Lee Rhinos. Ah, uh, I knew you'd know that. Yeah. Do you have any connection with Bradford Bulls these days? Uh, no, not at the minute. I think you, uh, I think you noticed that, uh, that my personal accountant uh, and also a company that I do a lot of work with on a collaborative basis with in terms of my sporting clients is Sedulo, their Bradford yeah. Bulls sponsor for this year. But, uh, and Ottawa as well. And Ottawa as well, which we yeah. no doubt will crop up in the conversation later as well. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've now learned more than I knew before, um, just on that little brief interview. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that uh, when I started reading the media, um, see, I, I always start with a LinkedIn profile because LinkedIn profile is, is the business world. Don't bother with some of the other more flippant social media channels in terms of <laughs> looking into professionals like yourself, Ricky. I still call mine to private now. <laughs> but on your LinkedIn uh, media, it doesn't say a great deal. It says that um, you're involved with um, the publishing company. Are you still involved with the publishing company? 
No, we, we close it down. We, we used to do the, when I worked at the Catalan Dragons, we needed a, a vehicle to do the, the programs. Right. Match day programs and just ah, the, the that's what I was, I was going to ask what sort of publishing it was. Yeah, the, 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 the cost of printing down in the south of France was just ridiculous. So the club as a, as a whole, we, we, we looked at it and thought, we weren't doing a program at the time and we just thought maybe there's an opportunity, a revenue stream for us, both through advertising and, and sales. Uh, so we actually got them printed in the UK and then I would either get them down to uh, get them down to the south of France by a literally plane, train or automobile uh, and, and get them down there in time for game day and then we had a, a team down there. That, that and you did that for a few years, did you? Yeah, we did it for a few years. We did we did a few we did a few teams, and uh, there's a, an MC uh, Malcolm Lord. We did his autobiography. Uh, so we did a few books. We did a few uh, charity fundraising events and calendars and whatever else. So yeah, it was. Uh, well, the next time we get together and have a brew or something stronger, you'll have to tell me more about that. But uh, absolutely. Yeah. But on the because there wasn't a lot on the LinkedIn profile, I, I looked a little bit on. Um, uh, primarily stuff to do with New York, which we're going to come on to. Right. And it said in quite a few articles, um, 15 years involved uh, in or on the outskirts of rugby league. So what do, what do you want to share with the audience in terms of your, your background in rugby league? Oh, you just mentioned okay. Catalan Dragons. Is there yeah, anything a, else that you've, you've done that you might want to share? Yes, I did a little bit with when I was at uni or college. It's that long ago. <laughs> I did a bit of time with with Leeds and and, and worked 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 some work experience time with, with Leeds and that was at a time when uh, the likes of like Rob Burrow and Danny yes. McGuire were, were coming through the academy the academy systems. Uh, then we got the opportunity to go, or I got the opportunity to go work for the Catalan Dragons down down in the south of France. So I actually did twelve years down there. Did you really? Yeah. Are you based uh, down there or are you, you tra travelling backwards and forth? All. So I did a couple of years based down there and then did a couple of years going backwards and forwards and then went back and did another six months, seven months down there. And then, yeah, so it was kind of mixed throughout the whole 12 years being mixed, being based down there and, and being based based here and travelling backwards and forwards. Uh, and then we, uh, me and my partner, my, my wife now, we got married. We actually got married down in the south of France. Very good. Nice story. Uh, down on the beach. Uh, so we got married down there and then decided that we were going to start having a family. And, and then the little one came along. So it was time to stop going down to the south of France over the weekend. And, Very good. And then, just shows you should have been my mentor. Then, you and I should have made contact a long time ago. Because <laughs> I think, as you know, I've, I've been given a contract recently to... Do a little bit of work with Toulouse Olympic, so yeah. we could have compared. Okay. Toulouse are great. Mm. Cedric and his and his team are, are brilliant. Ab no, lovely people, absolutely lovely yeah. people, and nice club and uh, serious aspirations. So that's how they get there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, the other thing we did, we remiss of me not to talk about it at the moment. Uh, I mean, this interview is about you, but um, uh, we're not without the odd little challenge in terms of um, uh, rugby league, are we? Um, I think you mentioning to me you worked at Leeds. That's an, a nice little thing to start off with because uh, what that says to me, I mean, I already know from talking to you a fair bit about your background and uh, your skill set. But um, from what I've learned over the, the more recent induction into rugby league, Leeds seem to be a bit better than most in terms of their commercial function and uh, revenue generation match day yeah. and, uh, around the club. I think as a club as a whole, it's just run really, really well. And that, yeah. that comes from the top. Uh, and, and Gary's been involved for well Gary got involved at Leeds in, in 97 but obviously set up his own club before then and, and was involved as a player and as a, and as a coach and as an, as, as an administrator for pretty much the majority of his life so so Gary's got a wealth of experience and I suppose that that, that comes down from, from the very top and he's got arguably the club's greatest ever captain there now as a director of rugby and just the whole ethos of the club just seems to have that. It, it kind of has that that boot room feel to it from the, from the Liverpool in the sixties and seventies and, and eighties being passed down and, and passed down and passed down and I suppose that's the, that's the sort of feel that, that Leeds has at the minute. Yeah, very very pertinent comments. Um, but that leads me on, and obviously as a theme going to to where you are today. Um, 
Do you want to just uh, explain what you understand by the current Toronto Wolfpack situation and, um, and what do you perceive that might mean in terms of um, the sport of rugby league and Super League? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a massive shame. And, and the world as we know it now is, is significantly different to, to how it was at the beginning of, of March. Absolutely. Uh, and, and early February. So the fact that, and I think I'm, I'm not the only one who's going to say it, everyone, every commentator seems to be saying it at the minute, but the fact that they, they were allowed to come in with, with zero central funding was, was, was a bit of a disaster for them, really. Uh, I think it's come to light over the last few days that that should, that should have been reassessed after three years and hadn't been reassessed. Uh, the fact that clubs didn't want to give them any money, it's like to, the example I've, I've heard and, and, and I suppose it, it fits really well is, is the goose that lays the golden egg, but then no one's been feeding the goose. Uh, so you can bring in someone who's willing to cover all the costs, to cover all the flights and all the accommodation and all the food and everything else. And, and yeah, there were teething problems at the beginning, but on the whole, it seems to have worked pretty well to cover all the visa costs and everything else. They've not asked for a penny, uh, but then it, it's come to come to the end and there's no income, there's no home games. There's, you know I mean, there's, there's very little in terms of, of commercial revenue coming in, season ticket see his ticket money needs refunding they're they're kind of in a no-win situation and they're kind of in a no-win situation all along for me there should have been some sort of central funding you don't get the exposure that you got when Sonny Bill Williams turned up at a press conference at the Emirates Stadium and the exposure that brought to the sport Absolutely. The, the other clubs that are, are being shown on highlight packages and, and whatever else I'm um, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but I would assume that people would have been able to stick an extra 10% on their commercial revenue streams, and particularly when they were playing Toronto, yeah, yeah. because Sonny Bill was going to be in town. Uh, and am I right? And, I, I, and, and you, saw that, you saw that from the first, the first weekend at, at Headingley, there was a double header. The Wolfpack were playing Castleford. And Leeds were playing Hull, and it was a sellout. You couldn't get a ticket, and everyone everyone wanted to come and watch Sonny Bill in his first game back. Understandable. Understandable. And and would there be another team in Super League who could have brought Sonny Bill to the table? Probably not. And am I right in thinking was there a uh, was there a proposition put out for the Super League clubs to consider that they all contributed to a pot that might uh, go somewhere to reducing that deficit? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not privy to those sorts of conversations. So I think. I think I heard that was the case. But again, it, yeah. it's just completely unrealistic because you and I both know. I mean, the clubs I've been involved with myself in the past, they've been they've just been doing wage cuts and things like that. The yeah. marketplace is not one awash with money at the moment, and people are having to cut their cloth accordingly. So very yeah. difficult times. And, and it, it's difficult. Uh, and it's particularly next year when when clubs the reduced funding again. Uh, from the central fund, from the Sky TV deal, so yeah, times times aren't easy in rugby league. I don't think at the minute, but uh, there's definitely opportunities, all being well touched wood on the horizon. And it's down the pyramid, isn't it? I think it was only yesterday I was reading um, again some of the challenges with Sheffield Eagles. Uh, again, they're, they're pulling out of cup, cup competitions. They're saying they can't fill, fig, fill fixtures. They have to start again with a clean slate because it's just not financially viable. Yeah, it's, it's sad that the teams who, the, or the lower league teams who, who made the, the Challenge Cup, the later rounds of the Challenge Cup, have, have had to withdraw. It's, yeah. it's a shame because they would have to take their players off the furlough scheme to play those games. Yeah, And it's just, unfortunately for them, because they've got no other form of income coming in, there's just, there's just no way around it. They just can't afford to, to bring those players back off furlough. So we touched base on Toronto. We'll have to see what the future holds for them. Uh, what's your latest update on, on what you've heard on Ottawa in terms of uh, their timescales on seeking anything? I think Ottawa, are, I'm, I'm very, obviously very good friends with, with the coach. Uh, and, and they seem to be ready to announce players and, and seem to be looking, looking ready that they're, they're going to be ready to go next year. And, you know, hands up and 
fair play to them and congratulations to them. They, they seem to be getting things right. And what, what do you think? What's, what's your view? Um, what's your view about more and more overseas clubs coming into rugby league uh, in primarily England? I think it's... With the greatest respect in the world, the game of rugby league, if you look back to 125, 130 years ago, when it was first formed, has the game moved on? The game was formed out of infighting, and it appears there's still the infighting is still there. Um, and like I said, for the greatest respect in the world, people see it as a northern sport, and they don't see it they don't see it as a global sport. They don't see it as a national sport. And, and, and you can see that from, from the TV audiences when, when England play or when Great Britain play. There's just no, no one there wanting to watch the, the national team. And that's, that for me is really sad because I grew up going, going down to Wembley and watching Great Britain play Australia or watching Great Britain play New Zealand. And, and I remember going to, to Wembley and... One particular weekend, there was all the fireworks on the pitch, and Jonathan Davis scored his wonder try in the corner, and and it and it was a great, it was an event that you wanted to go to. Nowadays, and that that was at Wembley. Now we struggle to fill Ellen Road, or we struggle to fill Anfield, and and I just I just wonder if the game has, has stagnated over the over the last, particularly last 20, 30 years, but. Uh, particularly more recently, I just think how is there an opportunity for uh, the game to expand into new areas to bring more people into the game, to bring people who've not necessarily heard of rugby league but take rugby league to them? Uh, there was a good initiative in the late 90s where teams would take games on the road. That seems to have stopped a little bit now, apart from yeah. the Catalans. They take games, they took the game to, to the new camp last year, which was. They did Amazing. indeed. Yeah. Phenomenal, wasn't it? And a, and a Super League record crowd. And it's just unbelievable that, that a team can do that. And if a team in France can do that, could, what could a team in Toronto do? Or what could a team in Ottawa do? Or what could a team in New York do? And that, for me, is, is the potential of the sport. All, all those people who watch the game love the game for the high intensity, the end-to-end -end nature of it, the big hits, the spectacular tries. Superb sports. The athletes who are on display are second to none. They are the fittest people in, in sport. And for me, if we can display that and we can show that to a North American audience who loves sport, they love end-to-end -end sport, they love the high, high big hits, the, the high octane, they love all that. It's the perfect sport for North America. We um, the last uh, uh, vlog interview I did was with Delvin Dickinson, who was a former Manchester Giants player, um, basketball player by nature. Yeah. And as we were talking about um, American football without all the padding, yeah. Um, and uh, he was he was intrigued. I, I didn't think he'd know anything about rugby league, but in his short spell over in Manchester, he said he had had some engagement with it. So that was yeah. nice to hear. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think the roots of, of Canadian football came out of rugby league. Right. Came out uh, came out of some form of rugby league being played over there. So there's definite links between between the two, and you know, people you get eighty thousand people going and watching two teams in New York to go watch the NFL. So I, th I think you, you're being really articulate, Ricky. Um, and <laughs> and what you're also saying is that things can't stand still. There is a need for people to innovate, whether it be the likes of bringing in famous players as Wolfpack tried to do. Um, I think my, my only take on it, and I'm not as close to it as you now, but I, I sat previously in the last couple of years in some Super League commercial directors meetings when I was working as a, a non-executive director of the club. And uh, certainly at that point in time, the likes of Rob Elston, CEO of Super League, ex-Everton CEO, as you know, um, was quite uh, vociferous in terms of his support for overseas clubs and the need to try and widen the market along with a myriad of other things on commerciality, commerciality and, and also the likes of TV broadcasting deals, etc. Um, but there is, now because of coronavirus, we're in a ridiculous challenge and it's a different world. But when we come out the other side, hopefully, um, I think there will be a, a myriad of commercial opportunities, which I think people like you are trying your best to take advantage of. 
think so. And there's, there's people willing to invest in the sport as well. Yeah. Move forward. I think so too. And, and you noticed, because uh, I don't know if you know too much about me, but you probably know that I tread over into the countries of places like Romania and Turkey. Have you... Uh, have you noticed the rugby league activities going on there at the moment? Yeah, the the the, the Euro 13s is is an interesting problem. Yeah, there's, well, there is that. Yeah, and they're doing a lot of rugby league now over in on the Izmir region on the west yeah. coast of Turkey with a, a variety of teams springing up. We'll have to see what their standards like as time progresses. Yeah, absolutely. But the, again, you take rugby league to new areas and, and to new people, and and you never know who's going to see that. Excellent. Exactly. Exactly. So, that leads us on to the whole purpose, um, and that's why you're so exciting, because if you follow the theme in what we've been talking through, um, you clearly are, uh, and it sounds like I'm blowing smoke up you, you know what, I'm not intending to, but um, you are clearly articulate, you know your sport, but you're also very entrepreneurial, but tell us the story, tell us the whole story from the beginning, how did this concept of New York City Rugby League first evolve? And where do you hope to take it? Uh, maybe three and a half years ago, uh, we probably started started throwing throwing a few ideas around. Uh, I actually think it started in a McDonald's in the UK or the US. The first idea started, yeah. Not sure what we were having, but but yeah. So the, the idea started there, and and we were having a we were just having a conversation over. The new, the new team on the block, which was the Wolfpack. Um, and there were just a couple of things that we weren't... We thought, there were, don't get me wrong, the Wolfpack have been a fantastic... For me, have been a fantastic success and have opened our eyes to how potentially sport could... Or how the sport could look. Yeah. Um, but we, there were just a couple of things that we weren't sure that they that, that were doing that we could potentially change. And one of those things were they were based in the north of England rather than being based in Toronto. And I get that it's cold in, in Toronto through the winter. Completely get that. And I get that you have to go do your pre-season somewhere else. Uh, but then once the season starts and once you, once you can play your home games, surely it's beneficial to be, to be based there and, and, and not be based in in the north of England, if you've got sponsors, if you've got season ticket holders, if you've got community programs that you want to roll out, it was it was just something that that for me, and it's only my personal opinion, it just didn't sit right. So I, we, we looked at how a proposal could could look, and and if you were going to expand into North America, where would the next potential expansion be? And we looked at a number of cities. You could look at Boston. You could look at going up into Canada, into Montreal. Obviously, there was Ottawa. There was uh, said Boston, Philadelphia. That's, that's arguably the home of rugby league in the states. You could go further south to to, to Jacksonville or Atlanta. But for us, the the jewel in the crown would would be New York, and and uh, it's a sporting city. And perhaps crucially, more than anything else, there's direct flights from the north of England through various airlines direct into New York on a daily basis. There's not to Boston, there's not to Philly, there's not to Atlanta, I don't think, anymore. Uh, definitely not to Jacksonville. So so for us, the, the only solution was was New York in terms of getting people, fans, follow you, players. And what was that US connection originally, Ricky? What was it they chose you to look at the US? Uh, I suppose I've always been a bit of an expansionist. I've always been a bit of a fan of London, a bit of fan, obviously a fan of Catalan. Uh, as a Leeds fan growing up, it was always uh, the first couple of years of Super League going to Paris to, to watch those those games. So yeah, it was I suppose I've always been a bit of an expansionist and and want to see the game grow. And like we said, if you looked at the Wolfpack coming in, where would the next logical North American team be? And that's where we thought New York sat. And uh, we went over and did a couple of reckeys in a couple of weeks over there just to to see how the how the how the land laid and and see if there'd be a, a definite interest. Obviously, to try and find us a stadium and a ground and and whatnot. And 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 on the back of those, we we came away with a, a couple of hotel partners. We came away with definite interest from the stadium, definite interest from from the mayor's office, from the tourist board. 
So it was something that we started to explore and we got, we got talking to a couple of people. We had a couple of people on the ground looking and, and doing a few bits and pieces for us, a bit of research who, who worked at the New York Giants. And, and they, pretty much everyone came back saying, yeah, this, we think this could work. And we think with the right marketing, with the right people in place, with the right product, we think this could be a success. And, and we started putting the bid and the, and the proposal together and went through the RFL and, and put our business plan to the RFL. And was it these commercial sponsors and partners, the authorities, the stadium, uh, the direct sponsors themselves, is, is that who's been bankrolling it to date? Or is there any benefactor behind the scenes, uh, yeah, so Marwin Kukash of this world? It's, it's, that, it's that long that we've actually gone through a couple of investors and we had, a, we had one guy who, who was born and bred in St. Petersburg who was a massive St. Petersburg soccer fan and, and he got fed up of waiting for, for the RFL to make a decision and then got the opportunity to invest in St. Petersburg soccer clubs. So, so yeah. we put that money somewhere else and then we found someone else. Uh, and then we settled on, on the people that we've got now who are, who are behind the scenes and, and working, working really hard to, to make sure that the funding's all there and, and uh, everything's all set in stone. So the next few questions really, and probably the, the two of the uh, nearing the finalisation of this interview questions. One is, what are the current challenges for you? And two is, what's the time frame in terms of when you, you hope to be playing the sport over here? So I suppose the, the challenges are getting into the States at the moment, because there's a, a travel ban on, on European and, and the UK, getting uh, travellers getting into the States. So I suppose waiting for the COVID crisis to, to die down a little bit, but, but Skype and, and Zoom seem to have... Wish I had shares in Zoom before the. Oh, precisely. Uh, Have you seen the way that's uh, exponentially grown? Oof. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. So Zoom's great, and the stadium has been great. We have a, a monthly conference call with with the stadium and the mayor's office, and, and the city of Elizabeth have have really pulled out all the stops. And one of our investment teams heading over to Elizabeth. I'm looking at the dates tomorrow. And he's, they've pulled out all the stops. They're taking him for lunch with the mayor. They're taking him for lunch at certain, op at certain businesses that are, that are interested in getting involved. And uh, we're potentially looking at, at maybe opening a bit of a sports bar in, in the city so we can generate a secondary, a secondary income and not just relying on the, on the rugby side of it. Very much so. Uh, so we've, we've got, they've pulled out all the stops in terms of that. And they, like I said, they I'm not jealous at all because I'm taking to play golf at one of the nicest golf courses in the area on, on Tuesday. So, so yeah, they've, they've really looked after him and uh, they've been really supportive and, and we, we launched our, our memberships last week and, and uh, they've got the biggest, biggest mall in, in New Jersey, there in the city of Elizabeth, the Jersey Garden Mall. And, and basically anyone who signs up to the membership, they take a voucher to the, customer services and they get discounts at pretty much all the stores that are, that are in the mall. Uh, Innovation once again and, and good positive stories, Ricky. Yeah, yeah. And the, like I say, the mall gets 19 million visitors a year. So, and 60% of that is overseas. So they're, uh, it's a massive mall and they get more, more, more visitors annually than, than uh, the Statue of Liberty. So really good. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's a really impressive statement. Yeah. It's, it's an impressive city. Uh, the mayor is really forward thinking. The Chamber of Commerce behind the mayor is, is brilliant. They've got a university there, Keene University, that we're, we're talking to about the potential of, of being our training facilities. The, it, half of Newark Airport is in the city of Elizabeth, so it's close to the stadium. And yeah, it's a, it's a really up and coming, up and coming city, which is, which is great. So you're a very buoyant person. You're a very motivated person. This journey's been going on for quite a while. When can we see you first playing over here in the UK? Uh, we're hoping our first game will be the 2022 season. 2022 season, uh, good. Obviously, uh, there's a few boxes to tick and, and, and whatnot, but I think we're pretty confident that we'll be kicking a ball in, in 2022. And we're still, uh, we should still keep our eye to the ground for prospective sponsors. You and I are going to have a little chat when the camera's gone off in a minute, see if we can uh, find ways of helping each other out. Absolutely. But, Absolutely. Um, always, looking, always looking for sponsors. It's a phenomenal story. I mean, the, uh, every single thing you've said to me has educated me. I've read a few articles online. Uh, I've read a bit in the trade press. 
I think the only thing I've seen in terms of the, the old adage of a picture speaks a thousand words is um, your kit launch. And uh, uh, not only does it look very impressive, but um, I'm particularly enamored to it because it's the same colors as Stockport Volleyball Club where I'm chairman. So what more could which, I want in life? Which one is that? The blue and orange? The blue and orange. Yeah. Is it I mean, still blue and orange? Yeah. The, the, I mean, we did an Independence Day jersey with the... With the no, staff. I saw that as well. Yeah. It's very nice. Yeah. yeah, that's just flown out. It's been, been unbelievable there. Uh, they can't, they've actually put a new order in before the first order. Right? Is that right? Yeah. yeah it's good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, they're, they're trying to introduce me to that kit company as well, so it's another one to add to my portfolio. <laughs> See what comes out in the wash on that. Yeah. Uh, but Ricky Wilby, I'm really grateful to you for your time on here now. No, uh, thank you. We'll finish the, uh, the, uh, the vlog interview as such, and we'll continue talking about matters that you and I want to uh, explore. But thank you very much for your time, and thank you for taking part. Thank you, Adrian. Cheers.